Okay, we're talking about section 1.7, which is all about what's called modeling. We're not talking about like going down the catwalk kind of modeling. Uh, we're talking about making up problems that can, like, models are ways to solve problems. Like, this is a model for a situation where two numbers add up to 72. That's a model for it. it it's a way to write it. Okay, so, anyway, we're doing word problems, basically, and they're tough. The, what I've told you so far is that if you can draw a picture, draw a picture. And then label it as best you can. And then write formulas that go with it. And try to get the stuff from your picture into the formulas. That works well if you can draw a picture. We're going to do some today where you can't draw a picture. But to start with, I want to work on your packet. So everybody take out your packet, if you haven't already, and turn it to problem 7. And I think I got you started on this yesterday farther than I got some classes. So I'm just going to reiterate a little bit. You got your circle and you got your rectangle in your circle and the key to the problem was probably noticing that you you couldn't measure straight across to get your radius or sorry your diameter but you could go this way and if that's 12 then you should be able to figure out the last side which I'll color in in green here this side is the side we don't know so to get that side you can use a squared plus b squared equals c squared because it's a big triangle. So a squared plus b squared equals c squared. If you haven't already written that down, write it down because that's the formula that you need. And now we're going to put in the 12 and the x and this side we don't know. So I'm going to say that uh, 12 is the c. I know that because that's where you put the. Oops, that's where you put the. Uh, Uh, the hypotenuse is in that spot. And then the A, I'm going to call that X. And that leaves B to be this other side I don't know. So I guess I'll just leave it as B. And that gets confusing to some people because they're like, what do, what do I solve for? You know, do I, I can't solve for the 12, obviously, but I could solve for the B or I could solve for the X. We already know X. We don't need another name for this side. We need a name for this side, which is going to be in terms of X's and 12's. So we want to get B alone. So we solve for x by taking away x squared on both sides. b squared equals 144 minus x squared. And then I'm going to square root both sides. This should set off some warning bells in your head because when you square bo root both sides, you need absolute value of b. But I'm going to let you skip that because the absolute value is about adding plus and minus, you know, and we don't need the negative answers here because negative side lengths would be irrelevant. So there is my B, there is my other side. And some people have asked, can you actually take the square root of those and say it's 12 minus X? No, you can't. It doesn't work. And if you're ever like not sure whether you can do something, try a real number in it. 144 minus 2 squared. And try and see if you can just take the square root off and see what happens. Well, the right answers for this would be 144 minus... 4, which would be 140. Square root of 140 is not a nice number. Would it have worked if I had just taken the square root of both of them and said that it was 12 minus 2, which would be 10? Is 10 the right answer? No. Square root of 140 is not 10. So what I'm just trying to prove there is you can't just take the square root of both sides, or of the x, sorry, of the 144 and of the x. So I have to leave it this way. So there it is, and there it is. Now I've got all my sides labeled. If you haven't already got that, you need to catch up. And now I've got my picture. What am I supposed to do after I have the picture? Come on. What's the next step? You need an equation. Good. So the equation here is about, let me see, number seven asks for... Uh, perimeter of the rectangle. Okay, I know a formula for perimeter. Perimeter is two lengths plus two widths. And now I can put in what I know. I don't know the perimeter, but I know the length, and I know the width. So I stick in the length, which is the longer one, which is this one, and then the width is that one. 
I put them in and I got it. And then the other one's just like that, except it's not perimeter, it's area. So I use the area formula and I stick in the length and the width. You can handle it from there. All right. Number eight, we're going to skip for now because it's a real pain. Uh, and I want your first problem of your homework that you do tonight to be more, more reasonable. So I'm going to be showing you how to do some of the other kinds of problems. We're not going to actually start homework problems yet. I will do the first one with you in a little bit. But here's the kinds of problems you need to know for tonight. One kind of problem is where you have circles and they give you information about the circles. So I'm going to give you one like that. Let's say that you had this nice chunk of flexible metal that had like this little design on it. Like it was sort of a, um, I've seen this with like moose or something. Anyway, so you got this chunk of metal like this. And let's say that it is uh, 12 feet long. Now, can you picture being able to wrap that into a circle? Okay, if it was flexible, you could like stretch it and make it form a circle. And then you bury it in your backyard like that so that it sticks up and it makes a cool looking fire ring. All right. So now my question would be, first of all, can you draw me a picture of that and label the circle and make sure since you need a circle, you'll need its diameter. Now, I didn't tell you the diameter, but you can figure it out. Okay, so draw and label a circle for me that includes the diameter. But the final end question is, what is the area of the circle? So start by drawing me a picture, labeling it well, and you'll be able to then use a formula to finish it off. Now, in case you don't know circle formulas, I'm going to give you two of them that you should memorize because we are not telling you these on the test. I can tell you them now. Area is pi r squared. That will be how it you use at the end of the problem. And does anybody want to share the other one? Circumference. Nope. Pi times diameter. Or two pi times 2r also works. I'm just going to leave it this way because that's what I used in my other classes. All right, so you should be able to draw me the circle, figure out what this radius of the circle is, and then use that to figure out the area of the circle. Okay, here's my circle, it's 12 feet this way, so then its radius or its diameter, I guess I better use a formula to figure that out, C equals pi times diameter, uh, and I happen to know C, it's 12, and I happen to know pi, it's 3.14, hey, I'm getting close here, I can find D, so then I divide by 3.14, and 12 divided by 3.14 is like 4, around 4, what is it? 3.8, so diameter is 3.8, yay. Do I actually use the diameter for the next part? No, I actually use the radius. So it would probably be smart to label the radius on here too. So if the diameter is 3.8, this would be 1.5, uh, 1 1.9, is that right? So the radius would be 1.9. All right, so I got my picture and it's labeled real nicely and now I can Go over and use the rest of the formula. Area, pi, r squared. I don't know the area. Pi I know. R I know. The radius is 1.9. So now you'd use a calculator. 1.9 squared is about 4, a little less, times 3 is about 12. What's your area? About. Rounded. 11.4. I believe that. Anybody got it verified? Anybody else got 11.4? I'm nervous now then. There's only two people got that. Who got 11.3 or 11.4? Well, that's a lot, but not all. All right. So uh, I guess I, I'm going to say it's 
1.9 is really close to 2. 2 squared is 4. It's a little less than 4. 4 times 3 is 12, but a little less uh, than 4 times 3 would be a little less than 12. So 11.4 seems reasonable. Okay, so area is about 11.4. All right, let's do another uh, of these kinds of problems, except this time with a cylinder. Sketch a cylinder for me. Draw a couple circles that are kind of flattened out, and then a line going up to touch each. Now, I'm going to give you a couple formulas that help for circles. Let's start with a volume one. Volume, and you're going to want to write these in your notes, because then when you're on your homework, it's going to ask you for these, and you won't know them unless you write them down. Volume is pi r squared for the bottom of the circle. That's the, the base there, and you times it by the height. Pi r squared times height. Remember for the cone, it was a lot like that, except it was smaller, because it was like cut down to just this of it, and that was one-third pi r squared h. Anyway, so there's pi r squared h for the, for the uh, cylinder. There's one more. SA stands for surface area. It's two pi r squareds. You get how there's two circles. So to get this area, you need two circles. Plus two pi r h. Now that's not going to come natural for you, but that's the rectangle part here. And the height obviously is involved there. And the two pi r is actually the same as a circumference. You know what I mean? Like if you if we were to cut this thing open, I mean, cut it right down here and stretch it out, open it up, the circumference would become the length of this rectangular piece. You have two circles and a rectangular piece, and the height is the height of the rectangular piece, and this distance is the circumference, which is 2 pi r. Anyway, I'm going to just undo all of that, clear up my screen here. So now, if I've got a picture of a cylinder, can you picture this being a, uh, a silo? Do you know what those are? You store the grain at the farm on a silo, in a silo. It's a big cylinder thing. All right. And let's say that it is three times as tall as it is wide. Go ahead and label your picture. You don't know the exact numbers, but you should be able to know what to write. It's three times as tall as it is wide. I haven't told you that yet. All you know is that the silo is three times as tall as it is wide. All right, next. The silo holds four hundred cubic feet of grain. Figure out the radius of the silo. All right, so you got a picture. Now you should label your picture with what you know. Everything you can figure out. Like, if you can figure out the diameter, then you can figure out the radius. Then you should set up an equation and plug in what you know into the equation. You should solve your equation. Then you'll have your answer. All right. Three times as tall as it is wide. I hope you knew to put this 3x and this. The width is x. Then, I hope you were smart enough to realize that the radius of this is not x. What's the radius of this thing? One half of x. Then, I hope you knew that we were talking about volume because it said cubic feet. 
All right, so that means we're using this formula right here. So I'm using volume equals pi r squared h, and I happen to know r and h, and so I can plug them in. So then I have volume equals 3.14. The radius is 1 half x squared, and then the height is 3x. Isn't there one more thing I haven't included anywhere? The 400. So I can put the 400 right here. All right. So now I get 400 equals 3.14 times... I'm going to do the 3.14 times the 3... Uh, times the one-half x quantity squared times the x. Now, I could go and do all of this out, or I could jump to one of the smartest problem-solving methods that there is. It uses a piece of technology that you have. And what do you think I'm going to do with the calculator? How am I going to solve it with the calculator? I'm going to graph it. That's right. I don't even need to type. I don't even need to figure out all that stuff. I can just type this in on the one side, type this on the other side. You remember, it's y equals this on the one side, y equals that on the other side, and y equals 400, and y equals all that junk. And we see where the two lines cross. If one of the side lengths that it gives me is negative, will that make any sense in the real world? No. You throw that one out. So grab your graphing calculator right now and graph it with me. Okay. So 3.14 times... I'm going to clear that. Times 3 times parentheses. 1 half is the same as 0.5 x parentheses squared. Notice I'm not trying to multiply it all out. I would just increase the chances I'll screw it up. Times an x. And on the other side of the equation is 400. And I just want to see where those two lines cross. Now my window look, probably looks different than your window. I'm going to do zoom 6 to see if I can see it on a standard zoom or not. Right, there's one side. Why can't I see that other line, that y equals 400 line? Where is it? It's way up, right? It's up 400. So I'm going to go to my window, and I'm going to change my y max to be more than 400, because if I just say 400, it'll just be at the, way at the top. So I'm going to say my y max is 450 or something. And then I'm going to hit graph. Ooh, this is looking pretty good. Sweet. All right, there's only one answer right there. How do I f tell where those two lines cross? Yes. Second, calculate the intersection. That's number five. And now, first curve, it wants me to get onto one of my lines, and the little spidery thing is on one of my lines, and so I'm just going to hit Enter. And then it goes to the other line automatically, and I hit Enter. And then it says guess. Now this is important. In case it happens to be touching at two spots, I would get over by this spot. And I hit enter. And it tells me that they intersect at x is 5.53 and y is 400. Do you think the 400 is the number I needed? I already knew that one, right? So that's kind of irrelevant. So the 5.53 must be it. So now, what did I just figure out? I figured out that 5.53 is what x is x is 5.53. Is that the radius of the silo? See, a lot of kids are just going to go through all that and they'll be so happy they found a number that made some sense that they'll write down 5.53 and won't even think about it. 5.53 is the 
diameter. So if I want the radius, I want half of that. So all I have to do is take my calculator, take 5.53, divide it in half. It's going to be 2.7, something like that. All right. Wait. Yes. When you were um, pointing out, why, why can't you leave it as or why did you move the three? You could have. I, I didn't even realize I was going to graph it until after I had done this. But you could have left it like that, and it would have been fine. You could have graphed that, and, and it would have given the same answer. Okay? All right, so my final answer on this is not the 5.53. It's half of that because this the radius is half of the diameter, so it's going to be 2.7 something. All right. And... Just to make sure that kind of makes sense to you, if the base of this thing is 5, the height of it would be about 15. And then you could go back and plug the numbers into your pi r squared h and make sure that it actually makes some sense. Uh, the radius is like 2.7, 2.7 squared times uh, about 15. Is that going to be about 400? Yes. So, all right. Moral of the story. I draw a picture. I label it. I then figure out a formula that works with this. And I stick my numbers into my formula. And then I solve it. Solving is sometimes hard. Your graphing calculator will help. You can graph and get your solving done that way really well. Okay? What if, it, what if you're not allowed to use your graphing calculator? Then you'd be stuck with factoring it. Remember anything that's... Uh, if you can factor it down and set it equal to zero. You know, like if you could go like this. You can get your answers that way. That works. Or you could uh, use a quadratic formula. X equals negative B plus minus square root B squared minus 4 is all over 2A. That solves these kind too. Actually, wait a minute though. This is a cubic. This was a cubic because when we looked at the graph, it kind of looked like this. So cubics aren't used, the, you don't use the quadratic formula for them. Still could refactor it. All right. But I think you're going to have a calculator in this test anyway. Next kind I want to talk to you about is the kind where you have uh, two numbers and you don't know what they are, but they do something. Like two numbers add up to six. Well, and I know there's a lot of possibilities. One and five, two and four, three and three. Um, you know, you could even throw in negative numbers if you want to make it complicated. All right, but uh, here's some strategies for you when you have the two numbers do this kind of thing. The first thought is... Uh, if you use two numbers as x and y, x plus y equals 16, you're, you really, it makes it pretty obvious you got your two numbers. One's x, one's y. Okay, and x and y add up to 16. But you need to be able to handle this by writing it with only one variable in it. So here's an example. Let's say that they told me my two numbers, one of them was Five bigger than the other one. Not five times bigger, but bigger by five. Then give me two things, not two different letters, two things that you could use for your two numbers. Yes. Exactly. You could use x and x plus five as your two numbers then. If one of them is five bigger than the other one. All right. All right, so let's try one like that. Uh, I'd like you to figure this out. If two numbers add up to, no, let's say multiply. Let's say two numbers multiply to 28. And one of them is five bigger than the other one. Then I might say, what is the larger number as my final question. All right. I'd like you to see if you can handle that one all by yourself. Remember, don't try to use X and Y. Try to use the same variable. X and then some other variant of X. Calculators yeah, allowed. But don't guess and check. If you're just going to type numbers and guess and check, that will not work for you when the kind we give you on the test. So you'd just be wasting your time. All right. Here's how you write the two numbers. X 
and one is five bigger. X plus five. Those are my two numbers. The product is 28. Well, the product means times. B equals 28. Yay, I got my equation. I'm pretty much done. Now I just have to use intelligent problem solving from there to figure it out. Just seconds ago, I did one just like this. This is a quadratic. So I can even not have to multiply it out, or I can multiply it out a little bit. X squared plus 5X equals 28. I don't even have to do that. I could have typed it in the way it was. I type it in my calculator. I get my answer, and let's just see if you can get it right from there. Because a lot of people will be so excited that they know what to do, and they'll have the answer, and they'll write it down, and then it's wrong. Because you didn't actually answer the question. Hmm. I can see that they cross. I'm going to go to second, calculate their intersection points. Let me give you a tip right now to save you time. From my experience, usually there's two numbers, and one of them is negative and one of them is positive. And your answers that we're going to ask you for are the positive ones. So I would trust the positive of your two numbers and not necessarily trust the negative of your two numbers. So I'm going to look for the intersection point here. I think I just did the wrong thing. I want to calculate the intersection, which is number 5. And I'm going to get on the first line, hit enter. Get on the second line, hit enter. And then it says guess. That means there's two spots that intersects. I need to get over by the one I want, which is the positive one. And I hit enter. And there it is. X is 3.35. Y is 28. Did I need the 28? Already had that. So it must be the 3.35. X equals 3.35. Now, that really doesn't answer anything. X is 3.35. So one of my numbers is 3.35. What's the other number? 8.35. Because see, it's bigger by 5. So I have 3.35 and 8.35. And if I wanted to be sure I was right, I would take them and multiply them and make sure they actually make 28. Know what I mean? This is part of making sure that your answer makes sense. If I think these are the two numbers, I should take them and do the product and see if it's 28. Now, if it's only off by a smidgen, well, that would probably be rounding then, right? So it's just off by rounding. So 8 times 3 is 24. So... A little more than 8 times a little more than 3 is probably 28. That makes some sense. So, now, final thing. What is the larger number? That is the larger number. And if you wrote this for your answer and circled it like I did, you'd get it marked wrong. You have to answer the question. What is the larger number? It's not this. The larger number is 8, not even x equals, just 8.35 is the larger number. Does it say anywhere that these have to be whole numbers? Nope. It can be decimals like that. Okay. So, how about this one? This will be fairly simple to set up. Don't try to guess and check because you'd be able to do it too easy. Uh, the product of two consecutive odd numbers is, I happen to have one that's not super easy to do in your head, 323. Product. Product, two consecutive odd numbers of 323. Well, here's the hard part. Figuring out what to use for X. I mean, I can use X for one of my numbers. You can always do that. But what should I use for the other one? Don't say Y. If it's consecutive odd numbers, what's the next odd number after x? x plus 2. 
let's see if I say just plus one, that won't be an odd number anymore. That'll be an even number, right? So x plus two is going to be the next odd number. So I got, those are my two numbers. And then product is, use your calculator. And in this one, I want to know what the two numbers are. Remember, trust positive one. So when you graph this thing and you get two answers, trust the positive one. Because it's kind of weird to have negative odd numbers. I'm not sure if that's even odd. Probably is, but we use the even ones. Usually the test questions will say uh, give only even answers. Yes? It's a good question. What if I got an answer that was even? I, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. So if you have, if you graph it and you get an answer that's even and an answer that's odd, just throw out the even one. It's as simple as that. You just have to know that your answers that come out aren't necessarily automatically right. One of them can be extraneous. All right, so did you do this? Did you get a number? What was it? 17. So you did this, and it was like this, and then one of these was 17, right? Or either rather, it was like this, I don't know, but whatever. This answer over here was 17. So 17 is one of my numbers. How do I get the other one? Yeah, just add two to it. So it must be 17 and 19. And what if it turned out you were supposed to subtract two from it? Well, then you'd know because you'd take these two, you'd times them together and make sure it really is 323. And if it wasn't, if it was like way too big, you might be like, wait a minute, I know 17 is one of them. And then you try subtracting two from it and then go 17 and 15 then maybe? See what I mean? So you try them and make sure they work. All right. So 17 and 19 appears to be the two numbers. All right. So we're getting a little closer. Here's the next kind that I know you're going to have to know how to do. They have to do with... Uh, uh, cylinders, and I'm guessing you don't have lots of cylinder formulas just running around in your head, so you might want to write these down. Try yourself a picture of a cylinder. And here's two formulas you'd want to know. The volume of a cylinder is pi r squared, because it involves a circle, right? And then you, what else does it involve? The height. Pi r squared height. That's your volume. How about for a cone? You remember that? It was like inside of the cylinder was like this. Remember how that was smaller? It was in fact what fraction we put in front? One third. One third. Good. But back to this. There's one. Here's another one. Surface area is two pi r squared. That's two circles. Think about this. This is a cylinder is made up of a circle on top, a circle on the bottom, and a big old rectangle. If you stretch it out, a big old rectangle in the middle. So it's two circles, two pi squareds, plus this big old rectangle that gets stretched out. It the, has the height in it, so there's a height in this. And this, the, the distance it got stretched out is like, imagine if I cut it right there, and now this string gets stretched out to be straight. Then I would have a circumference. So this is a circumference, which is also known as 2 pi R is also the circumference. So this one's 2 pi RH. I just want to show you where it came from. So there's two formulas that you'd want to know. 2 pi R squared plus 2 pi RH and pi R squared H. You might want to memorize those. Okay. So now let's do a... Uh, uh, one from your homework, because I know we did a cylinder before, right? All right, so let's do one of your homework problems. Would you please turn to problem nine? No, oh, wait, 11. Didn't get one yet? That's not it, actually. This is. Yeah. I only have one left. That was weird. 
just trying to figure out where my... Ah, that's right, because I just handed them out yesterday. That's right. Okay. So, numero... What's the word for 11? Let's say. Tell me what to put on my cylinder. The height is twice the radius. I don't know what they are, so I can't put numbers, but what could I put for letters? Sure. If I want to call this R, then I could call this 2R. I like it. Okay. Express the volume as a function of the radius. Hmm. Well, obviously I'm not going to use the surface area formula now. I'm going to be using this volume formula. They want it in terms of radius. That means that I can only have R's in my answer. So I just have to, well, I pretty much do already have R's in my answer, but I have an H. So can I replace the H with something? Yeah, that's really easy. It's, don't don't ever think this one. It's just, just substitute into your little formula, get rid of the H, put in what you can put in, put the pictures, stuff from the picture into the formula, and you'll have it. Oh, that was an easy one. All right. Your assignment is to do 9 through 13. Let's go back and look at number 9 together for a second. That was a little harder. Number 9 says a piece of wire is pi y inches long. Right there, some people get lost. Here's my piece of wire. It's pi times y long. All right, so I don't know how long it is. It's got a variable in it, but it's pi times what? But then it's a circle. It's bent into a circle, so I should draw a picture of that. And so effectively, they just gave me what? Not the diameter, the circumference. Yeah, they gave me the circumference. All the way around here, this distance is pi y. Now, it would be really nice if I could figure out one of these, like the diameter or the radius, because I will not really, really have a good circle drawn until I got those. So I'm going to use a formula for that. Circumference equals pi times d. I know the circumference. The circumference is pi y. And this just takes uh, two seconds of thinking. If I want to get d alone to know what the diameter is, how can I fix this and make it really a lot simpler? Divide by pi. If I divide by pi on both sides, see what happens? See how that'll cancel that? And that'll cancel that? What's the answer? What's D equal to? Oh. So this distance across here? That's Y. So now the radius is Y, right? No. The diameter is Y. What's the radius? Half of Y. The y divided by 2 is a good way to say it, too. So I'm going to make the radius like a different color, and I'm going to say Y. Or 1 half Y. Or Y over 2. I kind of like that better. Now, I probably have a formula I'm going to need, which you can provide. You know this formula for a circle. If you don't know, I suppose I can tell you. Here is pi r squared. But I'm not telling you on the test. And then you can plug that into that formula and is the answer to the question, which is I want the area as a function of y, meaning my answer has to have y's in it. And that's how it would be pretty easy. All right. The rest of the time is yours to work. I know there's not a ton, but there's there's enough. <laughs>